So Halloween Horror Nights 31 has come and gone. I mean, tonight's the last night, so I think now's the time to talk about it. Universal did a lot this year between the 10 houses, five scare zones, two shows, many food tents, tribute store, etc. But bigger doesn't always mean better. So I'm here to answer the question, was Halloween Horror Nights 31 a good event year? Did Universal actually deliver on their take on classic Halloween with ghosts and witches and pumpkins and all that? Am I actually gonna answer these big questions? Well, let me start off with the good for this year's event. Universal keeps impressing me with the attention of detail they include for Horror Nights, and that's in the houses, the scare zones, and the overall atmosphere. When you talk about detailed houses from HHN 31, your mind likely goes automatically to Dead Man's Pier, which is a valid take. It has some incredible detail in storytelling and structure, as well as some really fantastic set dressing. However, I think all of the houses have some really strong work done with them to make them feel really detailed. Fiesta de Chupacabras feels like a living, breathing town with its set design, and the lighting gives off that firework effect very nicely. It also has what I believe to be my favorite facade of the year, and I'm so upset I did not get the chance to tour this during the day. Halloween does a great job in recreating the film with its setting, and is easily the best interpretation of the franchise yet. Hellblock Horror, for the mess that it was timing-wise, came out to really surprise me with how many easter eggs they could cram in without it being an anniversary house. And Bugs Eaten Alive, while it was used sparingly, combined the 50s retro-future aesthetic with the bug theme in a way that was pure camp and I loved it. And as far as the other houses I enjoyed, The Weeknd was a super fun one that is great for those who enjoy his music like I do, and Legends Collide was the most heart attack inducing house, but really is just a mummy show with the other guys' co-stars. However, while the houses were a good time, the scare zones were the star of the show this year, especially in capitalizing on that classic Halloween aesthetic. Graveyard Deadly Unrest really stretched the potential of a haunted cemetery concept, with Victorian zombies, moving statues, and perhaps two of the coolest looking characters Brothers Sleep and Death, who I hope return again very soon. Also props to the audio engineers and lighting coordinators, because they really nailed it when creating the eerie tone of this area. Scarecrow Cursed Soil, while criminally short because of its location in Central Park, had a really fun variety of characters and was very, very dark, which made it especially fun to walk through at night. Conjure the Dark, which was the most surprising scare zone of the year, had characters that each had their own unique design qualities, and a fantastic stage show which I always stopped to watch every single night it went. And finally, Sweet Revenge did so much for the event in being a zone that was entirely themed around nostalgia for classic Halloween, with a small town fall festival turned bloodbath. The characters here look delightfully cheesy, but that's the point, and I love how that ties into the tribute store which is themed to a dark ride found within this fall festival that carries that same energy through a highly themed retail experience. And everybody loves a good tribute store, am I right? Honestly, all the scare zones do a great job in going back to basics with the event, especially after the bombastic year that was HHN 30. And I love how they introduce new lore while tying it all to one central idea. Major Sweets, the two brothers, the witch, and all her demons, all of these characters are super fun to interact with, and I can see them all getting houses in the future. Okay, houses and scare zones out of the way, let's talk about food. You got your classics like pizza fries and twisted taters and fried PB&Js, but this year they went absolutely bonkers with food, like so much that it was overwhelming, and while I couldn't try everything, most of what I did get was pretty solid. I really enjoyed the meat slocker, not just for the fact that it had that guy from that one thing a few years ago, but also I'm a sucker for creative packaging and they really knocked it out of the park here with this like fake butcher shop aesthetic. I really love the fried cauliflower and I know the fresh ground princess was totally an Instagram snack, but it looks so damn cool. I'm not a huge foodie, but I really like how Universal has been expanding their food options with Mardi Gras and HHN to have some more incentive for people to linger. It's smart for them and good for us because unique food, let's face it, isn't super common at Universal outside of the seasonal events. The last best thing I just have to talk about is the Dead Coconut Club. While I didn't have time to go in there this season, it looks fantastic from the photos and videos I've seen. If you know me, you know I will forever lament the loss of the Monsters Cafe, and they actually reused a lot of props from the Monsters Cafe in this Universal Monsters themed tiki bar. Like, come on, there's a whole creature from the Black Lagoon Lounge, how could you not love that? Live performers, characters, themed drinks, all kinds of cool pieces from the Universal Tiki Tribute Store over the summer. I don't know how I missed it, I just got really caught up with HHN this season, so I hope it comes back next year for me to see it. I just love how Universal was willing to step out of their comfort zone with this one, and enlist some really talented artists and designers to create this super unique spot that reuses the previously closed Red Coconut Club and makes it a way to experience HHN without going into the park, paying, and getting scared. So we talked about the best, and there was a lot. Surely nothing could be bad. Crowd. 
events. Nearly everyone has expressed that this year's event has felt the busiest in recent years, and while Halloween Horror Nights always gets busier by the year, this year, pretty much all the houses had overextended wait times, most of the scare zones had really bad congestion, and lines for food despite many more food stands could get really long. And this was early in the season too. It got to the point where if you didn't have Express, an RIP tour, or do stay and scream, you were bound to wait anywhere from 45 minutes to 2 hours for any given house, even on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Unfortunately, it seems like HHN has gotten to the point that it's feeling too small for the crowds they allow in. And even if they increase prices, which they did, the capacity is only growing. I'm not sure why they didn't use the MIB tent location for house this year, or the Blue Man Group stage for another show, but those are likely the two easiest places to add more offerings. But overall, the overcrowding was the worst thing about this year's event, and I really hope they consider all of this when planning HHN 32. It really sucks that we lost Ghoulish, the yearly Lagoon show halfway through the season due to damage from Hurricane Ian. Now I know it was nothing Universal had planned for, obviously we had a horrible hurricane, and I'm glad Universal was able to recover what they did. However, Ghoulish was something I really wanted to see, and while I caught little snippets of it, I never got to see the full show. And what I did see, I really liked. And I think this not only sucks for those who didn't get to see the show, but it also, again, hurts the capacity as well. Knocking out one of the two fairly large shows. Now I didn't get to see Nightmareville this year, so I can't really comment on it, but it's not nearly big enough to accommodate enough people to make up for the loss of Ghoulish. So on both an amenity and crowd level, Ghoulish closing before peak season in October was one of the worst things that's happened this year easily. Now I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but honestly, this year's event wasn't super scary. Now I'm not someone who goes to HHN with the sole desire to get scared. I'm more in it for the theming. But I noticed many of the houses and scare zones didn't really pack the punch that I was thinking they would. Now granted, there were definitely some scary houses, I think Universal Monsters Legends Collide was the most consistently scary house this year. But some houses, like Spirits of the Coven or Bugs, didn't really get me at all to be honest. But back to overcrowding, the scare zones for the most part are too busy for them to get in really good scares. Really, the scare zone that got me the worst was Graveyard, which was, on average, the least crowded zone of the night. Zones like Conjure the Dark and Scarecrow especially didn't allow for much room for scaring because of crowds. This is nothing against the design team or the scare actors. Again, refer to the first point I made. These houses are really well designed and the actors are giving it their all. Again, I'm all about theming personally, but I know a lot of other people are more about the scares, so this year may be leaving a little more of a sour taste in their mouth because it wasn't super scary. And that's it for this year. Oh, one more thing? <sighs> so I guess we have to talk about NFTs now, huh? So around the middle of the season, Universal started doing NFTs at both Orlando and Hollywood, and while they weren't really NFTs as much as they were like a little virtual catalog of the houses that you hit, it just made me go, huh? Because when I think of Halloween Horror Nights, the last thing I think of is cryptocurrency. Now I know Universal has a history of doing stuff on the website and the app to make it more interactive, but NFTs? Really? I'm not personally a big fan of NFTs as a whole, they're not good for the environment and are really shifty, so this just wasn't for me, but it seemed like something they slipped in to be with the hip crowd. And it seems like I wasn't alone, basically the whole fandom agrees. It just seems kind of silly and pointless when it comes down to it, and just really weird. And that's it. I thought it was a pretty solid year, honestly. We got some really good houses, some really cool new characters, and some good food, but also a lot of overcrowding and an inability for the event to be what it could be because of that overcrowding. As for next year, I hope again they expand by a considerable amount, and while it may be a logistical nightmare, maybe expanding out to islands doing the whole dual park thing like they did in the early 2000s wouldn't be that bad. But thank you for listening to my ramblings on the year, and if you liked it, you can check me out here. Happy Halloween, everybody, and I uh, hope you have a good one, and I'll see you next time. I have taken root and will now accept your praise. Oh.